Welcome to Bridging Borders, the podcast where we try to bridge the gap between cultures through insightful conversations. Together, we explore diverse topics from productivity to language learning, all the while helping you improve your English skills. Hi, Sam. How's it going? Hey, Veronica. I'm good. I've had a pretty good day. I've hardly had any classes today, so it's been really relaxed. And I did a 12-kilometer run, which is a little bit further than I usually do. So I'm a little bit tired, but um, I should have enough energy for this podcast because I'm pretty excited to learn about your experience of living abroad. Yeah, I'm very excited too. Yeah, like a 12K run sounds exhausting because I had to take a break from running due to my injury. I broke a bone in my foot. And so the first time I ran after like this whole period of taking a break was like three months later. And that felt tough. So (laughs) now like a 12K sounds exhausting to me. But you've run a marathon before, haven't you? Exactly. Last year. And I was planning to run a marathon this year in Mexico City because I moved to Mexico uh, a few years ago. But unfortunately, I couldn't because of my injury. How did you break your foot or a bone in your foot? Yeah, so um, it's connected to traveling. Uh, Obviously, I was here in Mexico and uh, I decided to go to this small town in Mexico because uh, a lot of people go there to swim Um, it has like very beautiful nature unfortunately I don't remember the name of this place already but I remember jumping off a rock and uh, hitting (laughs) my uh, foot really bad against the rock I jumped like into the water was like Mm. natural kind of lake type of situation the water was very cold uh, but for me it was just very exciting and very fun and I was like I'm just gonna jump off this rock everything is gonna be okay and unfortunately the rock was kind of like underwater it was getting bigger you know like an iceberg for example like you only see a little bit and in reality it's like huge under the water so that was what happened to me yeah so the water wasn't deep enough like did, no, did you go was... into the water and then you hit your foot on something or the ground or yeah the the rock mm, the yeah it was deep enough the pool itself kind of the pool itself was deep enough yeah. the problem was i when i jumped off and i started kicking i kicked ah, okay. the rock behind me yeah. because it was like larger than I expected it was going to be I see did you knew that you did you know that you had hurt yourself properly like right away even though you were in cold water I felt a lot of pain and I felt like something was off Mm. I was like it feels painful but at the same time like I'm not sure that you know maybe it's just like a small thing it's nothing to worry about mm-hmm. and then I I went to the shore I was like just sitting there and I just saw like my my foot like getting more and more swollen yeah and I was like uh probably there's something wrong and like obviously everyone around me was trying to like calm me down they were saying no it's fine you know it's just like a little thing don't worry about it it's going to go away and I was like yeah it's going to go away like I'm going to be fine <laughs> but the, yeah, I realized that I actually might have broken a bone there when I could not walk. Like I could not like step on my foot and it's been like one day, two days, three days. And obviously the swelling went down, but I just still could not walk. It was like I was in a lot of pain. And then when I returned to Mexico City, I decided to go see a doctor uh, I did an x-ray and yeah, the doctor told me that, yeah, you have two fractures. <laughs> oh no, that sucks. Yeah, I'm yeah. 27 and I haven't broken a bone yet. So fingers crossed, I I continue that way. Fingers and toes. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. cross everything for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah, it's, it's, I think for me, the worst part about it was that I could not travel. I could not even walk like even okay forget about travel but I could not like go outside and take a walk I could not run I I would basically just spend my whole day at home and for me physical activity is important because my job is sitting down in front of my computer all day Um, and and it's important for my mental health too 
And I would just drive myself crazy those months. Um, I had to like journal constantly because I, yeah, it was hard. <laughs> yeah, that'd be really difficult for me too. So yeah, fingers crossed again, that doesn't happen to me. <laughs> But I think yeah. since we last spoke, you've been away somewhere else, haven't you? You went on um, somewhere in Mexico. Let me think. Where did I go? <laughs> well, I'll tell you about my trips if you want while you yes. uh, recall those Absolutely. memories. Absolutely. Um, I think I told you in the last podcast that I was going to London. So I went to London to visit one of my friends from university that I lived with, one of my best friends. So I went with one of my other good friends actually from university and we just stayed for the weekend. It was really good. We didn't go much into the city center of London because my friend doesn't, who lives there doesn't want to do the tourist things and, and go that far. So he lives in a neighborhood called Kentish Town and we just stayed in that area and in Camden as well, which is the next kind of neighborhood along and we just went to loads of uh, bars and restaurants we went to chinatown actually once for some food Ooh. but went to so many cool bars there in like a 24-hour period i was like yeah this has been a good experience i understand why people like london and i've also been to leeds where i went to university to visit more friends from university and i've been in the lake district for a week as well which is a really nice area in the north of england which is famous for its natural beauty so uh, luckily my someone in my girlfriend's family has a house there so we were able to stay there for a week and go for a few nice walks but my girlfriend's got a french bulldog and he's only about he's, he's actually turned one recently and because Aww. he's got little legs and his breathing isn't great he can't go on very far walks so it's about an hour and a half walks uh, but still it's nice to be in a nice environment like that wow it's very cute yeah and um uh... I remember uh, when we were recording like uh, an episode together, you mentioned that when you spend a lot of time with other people, you might start feeling a little bit like tired, exhausted. Mm -hmm. And you just mentioned that like you went to lots of different bars and like uh, it was constantly like doing something, going out. So how did you feel? Was it tiring or was it more fun? Yeah, I guess because I drank quite a lot of beers or quite quite yeah quite a few beers uh the the social batteries just get like an artificial uh boost so yeah i, w I was tired the, the next few days but during the actual process it was uh, no problem at all yeah it's like when people go to music festival because mm -hmm. even though i always say that like i'm more introverted i like to go to music festivals and it's kind of the same thing you push through the, those like three days and then you're just like lay in bed for, yep. I don't know, a week, for a whole yep. week, because you're just so tired. You don't want to see anyone. Um, yeah. But talking about my trip, I yep. remember where I went. <laughs> That's good. Um, yeah, I went to Ayutla, and it was a very interesting experience. Ayutla is a very, very small town. I think the population is around like 12,000 people. So many Mexicans don't even know of this town. So if one of you guys is from Mexico and you have never heard of this town before, don't worry about it. It exists. It's just very small. Hmm. And the reason why I went there was because my boyfriend's parents are originally from this town. Um, they both grew up, like they were born and grew up in that little town. And um, when they invited me to go there, I was like, yeah, I would want to go because it's very different experiencing Mexico when you live in a small town versus experiencing Mexico in Mexico City. Mexico City is obviously so different from Ayutla. And uh, Ayutla is in the state of Jalisco. So I basically had to fly from Mexico City to Guadalajara. And then we took a car and we had to drive to Ayutla. It was like a three hour uh, drive. Um, it was a lot of fun because I saw lots of people like ride horses as a means of transportation, mm, like legit. Wow. Obviously, they had cars too, but yeah. a lot of people had horses, uh, like, uh, you know, their own like animals they had to take care of. And also lots of people knew each other. So this like sense of community mm. every time we would go to the main square 
you know, you know that the city is, the town is small because it only has one main square and everyone will be there and uh, everyone will be like, oh, like, hey, I remember you from yesterday or like, I remember you from that party. How are you doing? Um, yeah. And of course, just eating lots of Mexican food that is just like cooked in front of you and it feels like you're at home, like your Mexican mom <laughs> made this for you. So it was a good trip. I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, that sounds great. When I went to a few villages, I guess, surrounding Madrid yeah. and in Spain, it felt like it was like life had slowed down significantly and it wasn't as busy as it is in the city. And like you said, yeah, there's such a strong community there and everyone knows each other and everyone, it's almost like people are a bit more present and they're less wrapped up in what people call the rat race. Like they don't really care that much about their job and how much they earn and what car they're driving. And they're just there enjoying themselves being present. And that's what I really liked about um, the rural, more rural parts of Spain anyway. And I'm guessing it's pretty similar in, in Mexico and, and a lot of other places. Yes, absolutely. It was exactly the same thing. Yeah, it's just people cared more about like their family, I guess, because mm -hmm. they generally there, they have very big families, uh, like lots of cousins, lots of brothers and sisters. Um, yeah, and it's true that people didn't have this rat race also because this is actually something very interesting that I noticed. I noticed that lots of people who live in the small town, they had relatives in the United States. Mm. And that like surprised me a lot because if I compare a small town in Russia like this, like with a population of only 12,000 people, it's definitely not going to be like that. It's just going to be, you know, Russians, like they don't have any relatives living abroad. But in that town, lots of people had relatives who moved to the United States and who maybe would like come over for a weekend or for a holiday, a celebration. And uh, for them, even though it was such a small town, it felt completely normal seeing like a foreigner, me. Um, yeah, they felt completely fine. It was not like, oh my God, like a, a different person. They speak a different yeah. language. They're from a different country. No, like they, I heard some people speak English there mm, too. Wow. Uh, generally, of course, everyone yeah. only spoke Spanish, but it's just this fact that a lot of people had relatives in the United States. That kind of surprised me. Yeah, sure. So can you tell me how you've ended up in Mexico? Obviously, you're living there now, but have you lived in any other countries before after leaving Russia? Yes, um, that's a very good question and a very long story <laughs> because I, uh, well, I'm originally from Russia, but in 2020, I lived in New York City for half a year due to COVID. Mm -hmm. Originally, I was not planning to stay there for so long, but because of COVID, my return flight got canceled from New York City to Moscow, and I had to stay for six months. Um, it was an interesting experience because uh, it was 2020, so it was mm -hmm. COVID times. It was very harsh in New York City. Obviously, it was... A very different experience from going to New York City now, let's say. Uh, and like all of those like cool things people associate with New York City, I could not do all of those things. And plus, I was broke. I didn't have any money. I was a student. I was making just a little bit with my, you know, side hustle, my kind of part-time job. And uh, that was before, way before my YouTube career, <laughs> my YouTube times. Um, and then um, after living in New York City, I lived in Ukraine, in Kiev for three months. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was during the winter times, uh, but it was still very interesting because the place where I lived, it was very close to the forest. And every time I would wake up, I could see the forest and it was like, oh, so nice. And like winter, mm -hmm. the forest, the snow, Christmas vibes <laughs> and all of that. Um but then I think I got too cold and I decided to go to <laughs> Turkey. Wow. Yeah, and, that's very different. 
Yeah, very different. And I spent around a year, I would say, in Turkey, maybe mm, not a little bit more, around a year. I would say I was I spent around a year in Turkey, living in Turkey. I was in Istanbul first, and then I went to Antalya. And that's actually like where I stayed and lived the majority of my time there. It was very interesting because there was a very big Russian community there, Russian speaking community there. Uh, but I also got to meet people from other countries, which was fun. Um, and then I came back to Moscow because I was still a college student and like all of those like traveling kind of things uh, happened because I was studying remotely. And then my university was like, no, everyone has to come in. So return and, you know, we have to be in person now. But then I probably studied in person for six more months and then I came here. <laughs> so I came to Mexico. It was March of 2022. Hmm. Well, so when you went to university, you weren't really at university. You were just studying, but studying remotely. Like you were getting your degree, but you weren't actually in the city that your university was or you weren't socializing uh, within that university space. Exactly. Wow. So recently I watched the video probably on YouTube. You know how like we have millennials, Gen Z, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah, like all of those generations, right? And this video was talking about how one person said that there's a new gen, like kind of a new name for a specific generation. I, I think it's called Generation Zillion, something okay. like this. So your Generation Zillion, if you were born from what I remember between 1996 and 2002. Okay, well, so, I'm just out. <laughs> yeah, so I am in this generation yeah. and those people usually they had like this weird experience in college because of COVID. They mm -hmm. maybe like never even went to college in person. And my experience in college was it was only basically one year and a half. I had to go in person my first, like when I was freshman in college, it was like fully in person. Then my second year remote, my third year remote, my fourth year, it was in person and remote. And then my fifth year, because I, I studied in college for five years. Um, yeah, it was also kind of remote. <laughs> so it's a very interesting situation. Yeah, I always felt very sorry for those people at university or college uh, during the pandemic, because they are supposed to be some of the best years of your life. And in the UK anyway, I think that going to the best thing about going to university is like the social experience of it and just being in a place surrounded by thousands of other people your age in the same boat as you. So, yeah, I always thought my sister was actually one of those people. I think our third year was during the pandemic. So, yeah, I did feel sorry for her and I feel a bit, a bit sorry for you as well. But at least you got to travel to loads of different places. That's pretty cool. Yeah, exactly. I think for me, I I definitely did not feel sorry for myself that I could mm -hmm. not go in person because I did not like going to oh, college. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I'm one of those people <laughs> who are like, uh, I think for me, the reason why I didn't like going to college was because I knew that I could be so much more productive by myself at home. And it was like, I didn't like going there, but also I didn't like studying there because it was just a huge waste of time. Mm. And I realized that when I was freshman in college, because I my major was all about Chinese, the Chinese language and all of that. And uh, I still remember that day. I I was so motivated to study Chinese. Like I, I really wanted it to become my job. I wanted to be good at it. And then I would go the extra mile to do more things, to do more homework and well, not to do more homework. I would do all the homework and do more, right? Like just for myself. And I remember uh, we had this Chinese class and uh, I did all my homework and I also learned I think I learned all the numbers in Chinese, like how to say one, two, three, four, five, how to count mm -hmm. in Chinese, right? And it was still at the very beginning and I wasn't supposed to learn that. And I that's see. what my teacher, my professor told me. And that's when I was like, nice. So I have <laughs> to be like everyone else. <laughs> yeah. 
And that's basically the problem of, I think, education in many countries, but in Russia as well, in particular, it's just like everyone has to be like everyone else if you want to, you know, stand out, if you want to do more, especially if you want to do more. It's like, no, just they Mm. always put you down. Like, no, this is your place. Don't do more. If you want to do less, everyone is like, you're lazy. You're just Mm -hmm. lazy, whatever. Uh, But if you do more, it's always like competition. People hate you for that. Uh, A lot of drama. And so I think for me, it was a good experience. For my mental health, it was definitely a good thing that I, um, you know, lived in other countries uh, instead of that I studied online instead of having to go to college in person. Yeah, we have a a phrase in English. I think, I hope this is right. It's called uh, tall poppy syndrome. Have you heard of this? No. It's like when a a, a poppy, like a flower grows too tall, uh, like you cut it off. So it's the same height as all the rest of them. Nice. That's interesting. (laughs) So I guess guess that's what happened in in your case. But I think in the UK, yeah, because I studied politics, it's mostly reading. So I was only in for nine hours a week. So yeah and then the first in the first semester of first year i was only in on mondays and tuesdays so uh yeah nice. <laughs> yeah it was wow. pretty good i was like i can't believe i'm paying nine thousand pounds a year to go in for two days a week uh but you were supposed to do 31 hours reading because politics is mostly a, you know a reading subject like a lot of subjects we had to do a lot of uh, reading ourselves, and i think most people didn't do the required reading. So there's definitely not that many people going above and beyond, but there was always like extra uh, or further reading, which was available. And I think if you, you know, emailed your lecturer saying, you know, I've done all the required reading and all the extra reading, uh, you know, what now? I think they would just send you about like 15 articles just to shut you up. Um, So (laughs) that you don't email them again. Yeah, it's a little bit different. I agree with you because for me it was, a lot of Chinese like Mm. I had lots of different classes like history economics math blah 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 but Chinese was the main subject and uh, yeah had a lot of hours every single week sure so how did you find it when you moved to New York City because you lived in Moscow and that's a pretty big city New York City is a pretty big city so living in Moscow did that give you any experience for living in such a big city because I've lived in Madrid, which is, I'm going to say the word big city, the words big city again. Uh, but I think if I went to somewhere like London to live or New York, I think I'd be a bit overwhelmed because they're huge. Mm-hmm. Uh, to be honest, my experience was a little bit different because yes, Moscow is a very big city. And mm-hmm. originally I'm not from Moscow. I'm from uh, like a town, a city, I would say. Uh, six hours away uh, from Moscow and originally when I just moved uh, from my hometown I felt a little bit overwhelmed living in Moscow because it was bigger and I had to use the subway because my hometown we don't have uh, Mm. a subway there and yeah I felt a little bit scared and overwhelmed just like so many people and everyone was always running like running somewhere rushing and I was like oh my god what's going (laughs) on yeah. And I think because of that, when I moved to New York City, I did not see any difference in terms oh, really? of the pace of life. Yeah, I was like, oh, everyone is running here too. And the subway here is, like, is worse <laughs> than in yeah. Moscow. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I like it. Um, yeah, it was like an interesting experience because I also, obviously, I did not live in Manhattan because I mm. lived in uh, Queens. Okay. It was like probably an hour away from Manhattan. And so living in Queens, it was very like quiet. It was very quiet. It was a different experience. It was not like, oh, New York City, I'm a Manhattan girl. You yeah, know? yeah. <laughs> no, no. So yeah, for me, I felt totally fine. It's just I remember feeling the first month very scared to go anywhere by myself. Not because of my safety, no, just because Mm -hmm. uh, even though I could speak English, I still felt so scared to interact with people. I was afraid that they were going to ask me something. I was not going to understand it. I was going to be like, what? Can you repeat it? Oh, my God, I feel so embarrassed. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it was tough. I even remember 
again, it was before my YouTube years, but I still remember recording videos just for myself. As I was going to a grocery store, I would be like, okay, right now I'm going to a grocery store. I feel so scared, but I know that <laughs> I can do it. <laughs> just you know <laughs> hyping myself up like yeah. giving myself a pep talk yeah that's fun. that's pretty funny so your english was uh good enough to communicate with people uh like fluently at that stage yes for sure absolutely yeah, yeah. i mean maybe um my accent was a little bit different back then okay. yeah. like obviously i i'm pretty sure i have improved a lot uh during these three years uh but i no, I could still understand everything. I felt very confident in terms of communicating in English, but not when it came to real life situations, sure. you know. And was the listening like quite difficult for you? Because quite a few of my students, they they learn English and they can communicate with me, for example. But when they go mm -hmm. to England, they find it really difficult to like actually understand people and uh, yeah, understand what people are saying because people speak very quick. They use a lot of slang, they use idioms and expressions, phrasal verbs, and, you know, there's different accents as well. Like if you come to England, there are such a wide range of British accents from Scottish, Liverpool, London, Birmingham, Manchester, they're all really different. And, you know, if if you learned English in a classroom from, for example, if you're you know Spanish and you learn English from a Spanish teacher you're used to you know English in a Spanish accent or a little bit of a Spanish accent anyway so how did you find it when you moved to New York and had to listen to uh, or try and understand a New York accent because that can be quick uh, pretty thick as well can't it yeah absolutely um I think it was easy for me just mm -hmm. because my boyfriend at the time was a native speaker he was from New York City and so I think maybe one day we should uh, maybe record an episode about like dating between mm. different cultures. Sure. <laughs> I think it's going to be very interesting. Uh, but yeah, obviously I communicated a lot with him in English and Russian because he could speak Russian, even though it was not his native language, but it was pretty incredible. Um, I think that really helped me um, that I could practice my English basically with him. But also the main thing that helped me a lot was the fact that when I was in high school, my listening was so bad. Like my like I sucked at it. Like every time we had to do a listening exercise, um, I couldn't understand anything. And one day I, I remember it clearly. I was like, I cannot do this anymore. Like I really need to improve my listening. It's so bad. And as I always say, if you're really bad at something, it just means that you have to practice it more, spend more time. It's going to be very hard. Like there's going to be a lot of resistance at first because you just can't. And it's hard. It was very hard for me uh, at the beginning. And yeah, we just spent so much time listening to different things, different accents. And I think that really helped me. Like because starting from when I was probably senior in high school, um, uh, yeah, I was like senior high school and freshman in college. And then I went to New York City. So basically two years of constant practice, listening to different accents um, that really improved my listening. And during those three months, how much do you think your English actually developed? Do you think it was like a significant step on your English journey? Um, I don't think so. Oh, really? I don't think it was a significant step. Mm. I think in terms of confidence, yes, it mm, was yeah. a significant step. And when it comes to learning a language, confidence is very important. I, I don't want to say confidence is everything, but it's up, up here. Like it's up there at the top. And uh, I just started feeling more confident when I had to talk to native speakers. Because I think... Uh, many people who are non-native speakers and who are listening to us, you're going to connect with that a lot because uh, when you talk to a non-native speaker, when I talk to a non-native speaker, it's just like, oh yeah, I understand you. We're like in the same boat. You know, we have the same struggles. But once I talk to a native speaker, I'm like, like I see, I see them as a person who understands 
everything about the language as a person who might be <laughs> judging me. I know it's not true. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> but that's usually how non-native speakers perceive native speakers. That like yeah. there are some gods, you know, the greatest of <laughs> yeah. all times. Yeah. 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 Well, you can always flip to any of the other languages you speak and I'll feel like an absolute idiot. So <laughs> you're, you've always got that card to play. Uh, but yeah, I had a, a class, a child class with a new student last week and he was a polish guy and he just he was like oh, i'm just so nervous to speak to a native speaker i was like why and, you know i'm not gonna i'm not gonna be mean to you i'm not gonna judge you uh, this is a safe space for you to practice your english but he was like oh i'm just so nervous and i was like okay <laughs> you'll be fine don't worry yeah i think yeah. it's just the maybe yeah the fact that it's not the fact that you might like as a native speaker, you might judge me, for example, because I'm mm. a non-native speaker. No, it's more like, what if you don't understand me? And then what can I do? Because we don't have a common language. Mm. I mean, we have English, but obviously, if you don't understand me in English, like, yeah. what are we going to do? Like, how am I going to explain myself? Like, what, like, what language should I use? Because mm. if I speak, let's say, English to my Russian friend, in a group, let's say yeah. we're all speaking English and I know this person is Russian and maybe this person said something in English and was like, what? And then this person is like, oh, I, just whatever. I can use Russian. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's interesting because people say that like immersion into a language is the best way to learn. So, so I remember when I was in Spain, someone who wanted to improve their Spanish changed their setting on their phone to spanish as well so that they were trying to eliminate uh, english as much as possible so they probably you know spoke in spanish with their housemates they probably watched spanish netflix they, they changed their phone to spanish and people say that you know immersion into that language is being really surrounded by it uh, is the best way to learn so yeah i'm surprised uh you didn't say it was a significant step but like you said confidence is really important and especially speaking to native speakers so uh yeah mm -hmm. that's great so last question I'll ask you about, well, I'll ask you some more later probably, but where did you have the biggest culture shock? Because I'm thinking of the countries that you've mentioned, America, quite different to Russia, Ukraine, geographically and culturally relatively similar. Turkey, if I'm going to guess, is probably the biggest culture shock, but you said there was loads of Russian people there. So was it America? It was definitely the United States, Turkey, and Mexico, like these three countries for mm. sure. Because uh, when I first went to the United States, I was definitely romanticizing many things too yeah. much. I thought that New York City was this amazing place and, you know, because of all the songs and movies, uh, but then the reality hit me hard especially the reality of, oh my God, it's so expensive. Like, how am I <laughs> going to survive yeah. here? Like, what am I supposed to do here? Uh, that was hard, very hard. Um, and just like different things, everything is different in the store, for example. Um, yeah, I, I still remember the first day I went to a grocery store in New York City, I started crying oh, because no. I think it was just like the first week and I felt very overwhelmed. And I think mm. jet lag didn't help, like all of those things. I felt overwhelmed. I felt scared. The language thing, I could not speak Russian to anyone. Uh, it was my first time abroad well since I was a little girl like my actually first first time was when I was 12 and I, I barely remember that and so that was like my first time as an adult wow. I was 20 years old um, and I had to take this long haul flight and it was like one of my first flights it was probably my second flight ever um, yeah so I just felt very overwhelmed I started crying and my boyfriend at the time was like, what's like, what, what's going on? Why are you crying? And I'm like, I just feel so overwhelmed. Like everyone is speaking so many. I think for me was the fact that everyone was speaking different languages around me, even though we were all in the States. But here I see a couple speaking Korean. There I see a couple speaking Japanese. There I see, you know, a person talking on the phone in, I don't know, Turkish. 
And I was like, oh my God, but it's only like in New York city, right? That's like where you experience that because there are so many different people from different backgrounds. Um, but that was very overwhelming. Yeah. I guess, you, I guess you're quite lucky that you were uh, with someone. Imagine, I can imagine that would be a lot more difficult if you were by yourself, but that's still incredibly impressive that that was you know the first time you've been abroad uh, since turning, turning into an adult. So yeah, that yeah. that must be must have been a culture shock, and I forgot to say Mexico. Yeah, if I'm thinking of the countries, I would say Mexico probably would be the biggest culture shock for you because, you know, if I think of Mexico and I think of Russia, I think of very different things. Yes, I think for me, uh, overall, I would say it was Mexico. Even though I was definitely more prepared, but I was alone, and that was a big, like the biggest thing that I had to struggle with. When I moved to Mexico, because I started feeling lonely. And I think I have never actually understood what feeling lonely means before I moved to Mexico, because that was when it hit me hard. And I think a lot of people, when they think of loneliness, they think of just like sitting in your room and crying. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. some people like cope, you know, with this this way, but others cope with it in a different way in a less healthy way and unfortunately for some time I was trying to cope with it in a less healthy way and uh, it led me to feel even worse it was kind of like I was uh, making the situation even worse for myself even though originally I thought yeah it's it's fine I'm gonna be fine everything is gonna be okay uh, but yeah, that was definitely hard being alone and the language part too, because when I was in New York city, I could speak English. I just liked the confidence, but I knew when I was alone, I don't know, in my room talking to my teacher, I was very confident in English, but when I moved to Mexico, I spoke zero Spanish. Like I literally could only say hola and como estas and that's it. Like, I did not even know how to order the things. I did not even know how to, like, communicate with people whatsoever. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I When I moved to Spain, and that's the only country that I've lived in apart from the uh, England, I remember the first night that I arrived in Madrid and I someone picked me up from this uh, airport because I was doing a... A TEFL course teach English as a foreign language course in Madrid because I wanted to move abroad and do that so I found an academy in Madrid that did that and they organized to pick me up from the or just send a, a guy a taxi guy to pick me up from the airport and he dropped me off at where my Airbnb for a month was and the Airbnb guy said that yeah, you have to go into this bar to get the keys because I'm not going to be there. And I'm like, oh no. And I walk into this bar and I'm like reading off Google Translate, like key and the name and the guy had no idea. And I was just in there with my suitcase. I was like, this is going to be very difficult. And then that night, I remember wandering into the uh, city center of Madrid. And I was just like wanting to find somewhere to sit down and eat some food. I was by myself and I was just so scared to like sit down and like just sit by myself actually uh, because I thought oh you know you know people are going to look at me or judge me or I'm going to have to like speak uh, try and speak Spanish to this person I have no idea you know how to speak uh, to people so I think there is quite a lot of anxiety with moving abroad it, de it depends how much of an anxious or confident person I guess you are but like we found out in our last episode that we're both uh, turbulent people, meaning that we maybe overthink things and maybe aren't so self-assured in some situations. So yeah, I it, it's really difficult when you go to a, a new country and you don't speak the language, isn't it? And uh, it's a it's a real good motivator, isn't it? If you if you if you live in a country and you don't speak the language. So for example, I can imagine after a few awkward situations or difficult conversations in Spanish, uh, when you move to Mexico, you're like, okay, I really need to improve my Spanish now. It's a very interesting um, like comment because there are usually two paths that people choose from. And I have met people from like both of these paths. And I think I am on the first one. The first path, as you just said, is you just get so angry. Like first you get sad 
And then yeah. you feel sorry for yourself. You're like, oh, poor me. I don't speak <laughs> Spanish. But yeah. then you get angry because you start feeling dumb. Like every yeah. time you interact with people, you're like, oh my God, like I cannot do this anymore. So you start learning the language. You start learning the language. You start learning more things about the culture. Like you really want to get it. Like you really want to be like a part of it. You want to be like one of one of the people in this country. That's the first, the first path. And it takes a lot of time and a lot of patience and like being accountable with yourself. But the second path is you move to a country, you realize you don't speak the language, it's hard. And then you're like, well, I'm not going to learn the language. I'm just going to hang out with the people from my country only. And then I'm going to judge the people from this, not judge, but like say how it's all different here, you know? Mm. And that's actually because you mentioned immersion and that's actually why there are so many people who move to a different country and they never learn the language because they take the second path. They decide to stay, you know, in their own group. For example, for me, it could have been finding Russian, Russian speaking friends or only hanging out with Russian speaking people because obviously I was only comfortable speaking Russian at that point or maybe even like people who spoke English let's say but obviously not hanging out with Mexicans oh my god it's like how am I gonna talk all of that so yeah I have met people from like both of these paths and that's why when it comes to immersion, you are the person who is creating this immersion for yourself because you can choose the other path and you can kind of speak Spanish, you know, to get by in certain situations, but mostly you prefer just not to interact in this language and just, you know, it's fine for you. Yeah, you almost perfectly described me then. Uh, apart from the the judging bit, but because I didn't learn Spanish to a good level when I lived in Spain and I lived there for 18 months, which I'm, which is one of my biggest regrets, actually. So if I mm. have some advice for moving abroad is definitely learn the language just so you mm -hmm. can have a better experience and speak to more people and, you know, have, uh, create more connections with people, I think, and it'll just make your life a hell of a lot easier. So yeah, I'd recommend learning the language, but for me, it was, uh, at work, I worked well. I was in when I was in Madrid. I worked in a primary school, and I was with like teaching kids. And I wasn't allowed to speak in Eng uh, in Spanish. Sorry, I, I was only allowed to speak in English because if the students knew that I could speak any Spanish whatsoever, they would communicate to me in Spanish rather than English. And even though I couldn't speak, especially then, I couldn't speak that much. Uh, Spanish at all I almost used that as a little bit of an excuse like oh I'm not speaking Spanish at school and um I started you know I I was hanging out with a lot of American people actually because they were in the same boat as me because on the TEFL course that I did I didn't really make friends with anyone on the same uh group as me because they're all a little bit older than me so we didn't really have that we were at different life stages uh, but the the group that came after me that did the month after me uh, there were like three people three Americans around my age and I kind of made friends with them and yeah I hung out with them and their friends a lot and there's a lot of Americans and that was when I realized that British people and American people although speak the same language are very different people so <laughs> but yeah and I started dating a Spanish girl for a while and she spoke excellent English and I always got really embarrassed when I spoke Spanish in front of her, even if I was just speaking to a waiter or something. And at that time, I hadn't really done a lot of work in becoming a, a more confident person, especially not as confident as I am now. So I think at the time I was really shy and I'd really hated the idea of looking and feeling stupid. So that's why it really held me back from, from speaking Spanish, unfortunately. And then yeah, I just, I did get a tutor actually in Madrid, but after I moved to Valencia, I got a job in a college and uh, I wasn't allowed to speak Spanish there. And I kind of, I was learning Spanish at home and I could definitely get by and survive and, you know, have very basic conversations with people. But, you know, I thought, okay, I'm going to go home in the next six months so I can just take my uh, foot off the pedal in terms of learning Spanish. And then the pandemic happened. I was like, oh yeah, let's just 
I actually was learning Spanish during the pandemic, but um, not to a degree that I should have been. So I actually do regret not learning Spanish. And then when I've, I've been to Spain twice this year on holiday, and I can still speak very basically enough to impress English people because English people, uh, I don't know if it's the same in America, but English people do not learn second languages and they just expect everyone to speak English when you go abroad. Uh, it's very arrogant of us, unfortunately. But I spoke a bit of Spanish, like ordering beers and asking for the bill and, you know, ordering things on a menu. And everyone's like, wow, have you heard Sam? <laughs> and I'm like, this is real simple, guys. <laughs> Oh, that's so funny. I think maybe um, for you, you didn't have this like pivotal moment when you were like, oh, that's enough. Like, okay, now I'm learning Spanish because uh, maybe like not enough time has passed or well, we don't know like what exactly happened. And again, as you said, you had like lots of things that kind of like stopped you from having this like pivotal moment or mm. this moment of like oh yes now I'm doing it because as you said you could not speak Spanish at your work for example for me uh, even though I've been living in uh, Mexico for almost two years now I only actually started learning Spanish like learning seriously probably seven six months ago uh, because before that I also I were like I was like I, I still had to finish college. I was studying online. I had to wake up early and I had to study Chinese, you know, like do all of that. And I was just like, I don't have enough mental capacity. Well, I was sure. giving myself a lot of excuses, right? <laughs> um, but then I think one thing that really changed my perspective was when I went to the United States, actually, when I went to Arizona with my boyfriend to visit his family and they only spoke Spanish. Well, they they can speak English too, but, you know, with each other, they interacted with Spanish. And I was like, I want to be like a part of those conversations too. Like, what is going on? Of course, they were like kind enough to switch to English, blah, blah. blah. But I actually didn't want them to switch to English. I wanted to listen to them in Spanish because it kind of like, it felt like there was more life obviously, because Spanish was their native language. And yeah, when I returned to Mexico, I was like, I'm doing it. I need to push through. And now I can say, I think for me, the first three months of like learning the language consistently are the hardest. It's when I personally experienced the most resistance because it feels like you're a complete beginner. There's so much to learn. There's so much you don't know. And you feel like every time you learn something new, it's like, I would say it's like a tree, like a branch. You kind of, you see that the branch is continuing, it's bigger, it's longer, and it feels scary because you're at the very beginning of this branch. Like you're not in the middle or close, closer to the end. You're like, you see like all of those little pathways and you're like, oh no. Yeah. yeah, but that is a good pivotal moment. Yeah, one of my students recently, uh, one of my new students recently, he's from Lithuania and he went to his daughter's wedding in England and he's a doctor and he's probably pretty well respected in Lithuania because he's a doctor, but he can't speak that great English. And he probably, that was his pivotal moment as well, where he's like, I'm going to improve my English because I want to communicate with you know, my daughter's husband and you know his family and his friends and stuff. So I think, yeah, those personal moments are really motivating. I did have something you know, similar uh, almost on a daily basis in Valencia and Madrid where I'm in the teacher's, uh, teacher's room. You know, it was finally a good moment to see what the teacher's room is like because you remember at school, you're like, you just see this door and it's like teachers and you see them drinking coffee in there. You're like, oh, what, what happens in there? Do they all talk about us? The secret door. Yeah, exactly. Um, and they do speak about the students. It's, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, quite rudely actually. <laughs> so... Yeah, that was uh, surprising. But I remember sitting in there in the canteen and stuff and just being surrounded by people speaking Spanish. And I'm just sitting there like, yeah, I, I don't understand a word that's being said. And that was quite motivating. But I guess something a bit more personal, like a wedding or, you know, visiting your boyfriend's family. Uh, that's definitely more motivating in my opinion. But Apart from learning a language and being motivated to learn a language, what are some positives about moving to a different country? Because, you know, now is probably the 
um, the time where it's easiest to move to a different country, obviously depending what what's happening in each individual country. But I feel like now is easier than ever to move abroad. So what are some of the benefits or positives and would you recommend it? Um, I think for me, it was definitely the personal growth I experienced because when I moved to Mexico, there there was so many different things I had to work with. And in terms of my mental health, in terms of like my own resilience and independence, even though I was still pretty independent, but I felt like I felt like I just missed everyone so much. I was all alone. And like this, those thoughts in my brain, they were not helping me at all, obviously. And uh, yeah, it was like when people say like stepping out of your comfort zone. Yeah, it was like a major step out of my comfort zone, definitely moving to Mexico. Um, Because I had to learn how to understand myself better, how to understand my values, what my values even were, because, yeah, it was a whole lot of things. So that's why I think it's very important, like, if you decide to move somewhere, it's a very big step. So making sure that you have enough support is important like support maybe a therapist or maybe some courses you're taking or maybe you're watching this youtube channel that talks about mental health and it's helping you maybe you're journaling for your mental health maybe you have a friend you know you you can always like lean back into and always talk to them about your problems and it's going to help you but this making sure you just have support in terms of your mental health is so important um that's the first thing Uh, personal growth and the second thing is I think um, building a diverse network of friends and acquaintances from different cultures and different backgrounds because I moved to Mexico City and uh, to be honest before moving here I didn't know that Mexico City can be so diverse Um, I you know I managed to meet people from so many different countries and more and more people are coming to Mexico City and I think for me that turned out to be very rewarding in a way it made me feel like I was a part of something I was not alone and uh, I could like share my insights I could maybe help people experience my culture a little bit more, even though they could not obviously go to Russia. Um, But still, I think definitely, so personal growth and I would say diverse friendships and relationships. Yeah, I agree. I think that's one of the biggest positives that I experienced as well. And I think I um, saw more personal growth when I lived in Madrid rather than Valencia even though I lived in Valencia for a double the time I lived there for a year my bet one of my well my best friends joined me in Valencia because he finished university and yeah we we lived there to, uh, together for a year so but I, I moved to Madrid by myself it was quite uh, improvised and spontaneous I was I just finished university I didn't I didn't know what job to get I didn't want to get a boring graduate job in politics uh, my plans after university fell through a bit and everyone who goes to the UK gets like an overdraft of £2,000 in your bank. So you get like 0% interest on it. So I, I like most British students, had maxed that out and has £2,000 in debt. You know, that's not even thinking about the 27000 or more for university fees. And I needed to get a job and I was doing night shifts at uh, Saint, uh, Sainsbury's, which is a supermarket in the UK. And it just made me so miserable that I was like, I need a dramatic change. So yeah, I really want to move abroad. And then I moved to uh, Madrid by myself. And yeah, like you, it's a big jump to move somewhere by yourself. But I think it's incredibly rewarding and the personal growth you uh, see and experience. And you do learn a lot about yourself and you uh, you, you go through some challenging periods. I, I think that's, I think everyone who moves abroad will experience something difficult, especially by yourself. Uh, but it's incredibly rewarding. My sister's in Stockholm, Sweden now. And I think, you know, she gets homesick, her boyfriend's here in, in England, but, you know, I think she she's loving it and it'll be incredibly rewarding for her as well. So 
less less personal growth in Valencia, I think, because I had my best friend there. I don't know why that is, um, but yeah, that was my experience. Maybe because it was less new as well. Like I'd been living in Spain for six, six months already. Um, you know, Spanish was better at that point. Uh, the pandemic helped because, well, not, well, helped because there's less challenging situations apart from actually just dealing with the unknown of the pandemic and it being it it being scary to go into any shop or supermarket um so yeah but yeah personal growth and uh, exploring different cultures and people and making those connections is really good it's just it's just a nice memory to have as well it's like people remind me like you know when you lived in spain you know what was it like or like you know what did you do for this it's like oh yeah i did live in spain for it you know 18 months that's pretty cool and my biggest fear in life is waking up middle-aged and thinking oh i've really wasted that uh, and i think living in spain for 18 months was a good experience and i think I'll, I'll look back on that forever with happy memories and even with you know photos or no photos i've got some great memories of of, of that experience and you know it's motive thinking about it is motivating for me to want to live somewhere else as well so maybe even though i am in england now uh, maybe i will move to a different country soon yeah absolutely um yeah one last thing that i wanted to add is that for me when i moved to mexico even though maybe like some of you guys listening you might think oh if you struggle so much why didn't you just go back mm. But for me, I always knew that I could, you know, it's my home country. Like I can always go back, but like, will I ever have another opportunity to try and build my life in a different country? We don't know, maybe, or maybe not, maybe, you know, who knows? And so I think this like thought always kept me going like during the first year to be honest during the first year in Mexico I it was hard but I was always like reminding myself you're gonna do everything you can to stay here because you can always go back you can always go back if something you know but try try to do whatever it takes to stay yeah I completely agree I think that's a good message to end on I think I when I was you know, thinking about this episode and what we're going to speak about and the idea of advice. I was like, do it. First of all, yeah, do it, move abroad. And second of all, stick with it because you can't just at the first hurdle give up and think, oh, I'm going back home. But it's nice to remember that's always an option. You can always go back home if things get really, 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 really bad. Uh, you can always go back home. But once you do go back home, it's, you know, unlikely that you're going to go back, especially to that country. And someone who, who was on my TEFL course, actually, she's from America. So America to Spain is a, a long way. And she dropped out and moved back to um, America pretty quickly, I think within the first couple of months. So yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure somewhere, sometimes she's uh, waking up in the middle of the night thinking, oh, I wish I stayed in Madrid for a bit longer. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, so, so I think on this note, we can wrap up this episode. It was a very interesting discussion. And guys, if you want to get access to the transcript of this conversation, you can do it. You can download it completely for free. The link is going to be in the notes to this episode. So thank you, Sam, so much. And thank you to everyone for listening to us today. Yeah, thank you, Veronica. And thank you, everyone listening. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Bridging Borders. If you enjoyed the conversation, be sure to subscribe to the podcast for more useful insights. Stay connected by following us on social media. You can find us at bridging underscore borders underscore podcast. Until next time, keep exploring, keep learning and keep connecting.